Hi, and welcome to theCUBE, the leading source for insights into the world of technology and innovation. I'm your host, Donald Klein, and today's topic is the market for autonomous vehicles and the ecosystem suppliers looking to tap into this brave new world of autonomous capabilities in our daily commute. To have this conversation, I'm joined by Rudy Berger, managing partner at Woodside Capital. Rudy, welcome to the show. Thanks, Don, it's great to be here. Great, so look, why don't we start off, Rudy, why don't you tell us a little bit about Woodside Capital and your role there? Great, so I founded Woodside Capital about 20 years ago, having started five different companies of my own, one I took of which I took public. Um, we are a specialist M&A advisor. Um, we work with so-called growth stage, uh, often venture-backed companies, and help them find buyers uh, that are usually much larger public companies. Uh, our clients are usually US or European companies, and we find buyers in the US, Europe, uh, or Asia. Excellent, excellent. Okay, and why don't you talk a little bit about your kind of specialty areas? So, uh, I focused my career, and certainly the work at Woodside Capital, on imaging technologies and as an enabling technology and the products and markets that are enabled by imaging and increasingly computer vision. So nowadays that um, is autonomous vehicles, uh, consumer technology, uh, security, surveillance, um, and uh, digital health. Excellent. So enabling technologies, uh, the computer vision is the theme that uh, binds those together. Okay, well, the thing that's on everybody's mind these days is uh, autonomous vehicles, when sure. we're going to get them. Yep. Uh, very high profile, for sure. Uh, before the show, we were talking about the kind of two key ingredients to making this happen. Uh, the AI software, which is kind of the brains of the operation, yep. and then also the sensors, which enable all of the AI. Yep. So, so why don't we talk about the sensor world first, okay? A sure. uh, lot, of, lot of discussion about there, sort of does the new, brave new world of vehicles need LiDAR? Does it not need LiDAR? Uh, are there other types of sensors coming along? What, what's your sense of that market and how it's looking for, for all of the different players in it? So, Don, I look at it uh, from a, a sort of fairly basic uh, standpoint. Humans have two very capable image sensors and a very powerful processor. And um, the degree to which the uh, automotive manufacturers and so-called robo-taxi uh, developers have decided it's necessary to sprinkle uh, every sensor known to man, and I'm talking LiDAR, radar, ultrasound, thermal, uh, and of course cameras, is, that, is to some extent a degree to which um, you know, our image sensors are not as good as our eyes today. Um, now there are some areas in which um, we will probably um, always have technology as a help. For example, humans are not very good at seeing in the dark. Um, and whereas a um, thermal uh, technology can do that very well. Um, but my overall belief is that it's never a good idea to bet against a, an incumbent technology. And in this case, I'm talking about so-called CMOS image sensors, which are you know, the, the sensor that goes into pretty much every camera in the world now. It's never a good idea to bet against the incumbent technology you know, being able to scale into a new market. Every time people have done that, they've been wrong. Okay. Um, back in the early days, um, you know, the, the debate was whether uh, CMOS image sensors would ever be good enough to replace CCDs mm. as the um, sensor technology. Um, and of course now, you know, everything uses CMOS image sensors. Um, in other markets, there was a long period of time in which um, people were uh, thinking that LCD panels would never be large enough to replace, um, you know, for television, for example, 50 inch and so forth. It was never going to happen. So we needed plasma TVs, we needed rear projection TVs, but slowly but surely, the incumbent technology, LCDs, expanded to, to that market. Okay. So my belief is that CMOS image sensors um, will evolve to a point at which uh, they will replace the need for LiDAR in most applications. Interesting, so that, that, that's a very controversial statement, right? Because yes. you've certainly seen a lot of emphasis on the development of new generation LiDAR o capabilities. Over 100 LiDAR companies started over the last uh, three, four years. 
Um, and of course, uh, many of them will not be happy to hear me say that. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, there are two distinct markets, um, and one is the so-called robo-taxi market, okay. and the other is more of the consumer vehicle um, uh, ADAS market. And I think we need to think about those separately because the economics um, behind both are very different. Interesting. Um, if you look at the robo-taxi market, those vehicles tend to be much more expensive um, and are relatively price insensitive. So if they can improve safety a little bit by putting a LIDAR on there, um, you know, great, let's do it, multiple LIDARs, um, because these vehicles will be in operation 24 by seven. Right? Um, and if it, each vehicle costs $200,000, $250,000, fine. Um, the sort of, the, when we talk about the mass market for automobiles, type of car that you and I might go down and buy, very different thing. And you know, uh, automakers sweat the pennies. And so putting a, uh, a one or $200 LiDAR in a vehicle, big decision. Interesting. Um, and to the, ex to the extent that they can replace the need for that LiDAR with a much less expensive camera system, that's what they'll do. Bear in mind that Mobileye, which you know, has been the biggest success story, acquired by Intel for $13.5 billion, second largest acquisition Intel ever made, um, they, um, you know, for the most part, still run on one camera, forward-looking camera. That's it, no radar, no LIDAR, no thermal, one camera. So, you know, the clever use of image processing, computer vision, and one image sensor can do a great deal. Interesting, okay. Well, so I want to talk about the software in just a second, but yeah. just to kind of finish this point, so if you were advising a sensor company that's developing some next-gen uh, capabilities, whether LiDAR or other related technologies, is the point you're making here that there are certain segments of this, of this industry which are going to be more attractive to your technology than others? Uh, absolutely, yes. I mean, f the first thing to recognize is that the automotive industry has never really been a particularly comfortable fit with the economics and timeline of uh, venture capital. Uh, VCs need to invest uh, and recoup and redeploy back to their LPs on an eight year cycle. But um, the automotive industry moves quite slowly, uh, perhaps Tesla accepted. And what the first piece of advice I would give these companies is, you know, it's probably going to be three, four, five years before, even if you have the right technology, before that technology really starts generating any significant volume and revenue. So, you know, for many venture backed companies, that's too long. Yeah. And what they need, so the first piece of advice is find uh, pockets of revenue, right? Beachheads, if you will, where you can land your technology and start generating revenue before you get to the automotive market. Um, and you know, many of these LiDAR companies we just talked about um, are not going to last long enough to get to the automotive market. Because not only does the automotive market, market move slowly, but the autonomous vehicle market keeps on getting pushed out to the right as the industry realizes that this is a big, hairy problem. Interesting. And um, so I, I would say, you know, what is it that your technology can do? You know, an order of magnitude better than any other uh, technology. Focus on that and find some opportunities for revenue outside the automotive industry that will sustain the company um, on its way to you know, the holy grail. Interesting, yeah. So find that alternative revenue source that gets you to base camp, yep. and then when the market's ready, climb that Everest to... I've, I've seen so many companies um, you know, basically uh, go out of business because they've set their sights on either the automotive market and it's you know, go for broke. We, yeah. you know, we're not interested in it. all these other things are distractions. You know, entrepreneurs don't have a plan B. <laughs> uh, or this, mm. you know, we're going to get our technology into a smartphone. Mm. You know, that's it. And there are possibly some other opportunities, but 
it takes so long and it's so difficult to get your technology into a smartphone that they go out of business before they ever get to that point. Interesting, okay. Very, so good advice for, for people looking to kind of apply their technology in this kind of a, Absolutely. a very difficult market, right? Very yep. complicated market. Yep. All right, well then let's switch to the other side of it. So we were kind of talking about the key ingredients, right? Sensors, but Sensors, also yep. AI yep. and the software around that, okay? Uh, there, and there are some very big players developing the software. Uh, Tesla's had their autonomy day where they've show, showcased their technology. You've obviously got Google with, with their capabilities developing software. How do you how do you make sense of this overall landscape? Because we do see a lot of smaller providers also trying to yep. uh, develop software here. Yep. But so the first thing that I find fascinating about the um, automotive industry is that for the most part, there is no software market. Um, you know, there's perhaps one exception of any scale uh, that's BlackBerry mm -hmm. that sells uh, the QNX software. Um, they found a um, a point within the entertainment console where they can license their software. But you know, for all of the development and capital invested into automotive software, nobody is actually uh, generating revenue, making a living um, by licensing software. And one of the main reasons for that is that you know, the automotive market really since inception has been a hardware business. You know, th this is a business of bending uh, sheet metal, internal combustion engines, and software has really not played that big a role up until relatively recently. So, um, you know, even those companies that do have software technology have ended up um, selling it into the automotive supply chain as a piece of silicon, embedded mm -hmm. on a piece of silicon, mm -hmm. not as, you know, here's my software on a USB stick, mm -hmm. right? Um, I think that the whole software licensing model hasn't so far fit well, fit comfortably with the automotive um, industry. And the other reason is that there's no standard platform. If I were to develop a piece of software, you know, I can, in uh, the PC industry, I can develop for Windows, I can develop for Mac, I can develop for an iPhone. There's no such thing uh, in the automotive industry. And particularly in this new world of autonomous vehicles, there is no standard platform. There are many different processes, NVIDIA you know, has staked mm -hmm. an early claim there. Um, and the reason that most of the companies developing autonomous vehicle technology had developed the so-called full stack solution, everything from you know, uh, code running on the processor to the integrated to the sensors and so forth, is for that reason. There is no standard platform. So each company has developed the whole solution for themselves. And um, you know, there are many of them around here that have raised hundreds of millions of dollars, some cases billions of dollars, um, for, uh, for that purpose. So you know, there is today no software market for automotive in the same way that we think about it in you know, other industries. Understood, understood. Uh, but the, in terms of the, the, the companies that are actually pushing the envelope on these yeah. kind of capabilities, right? So we're, we're taking the best of AI, we're applying it to yep. you know, big data sets, uh, and, then, and then hopefully being able to extract that to create kind of capabilities for these vehicles, right? Yes. What, what's your sense of how far that's come along? In well, it's, it's, um, it, it's come a long way, but um, here I'm going to push the boat out a little bit. Um, I don't believe that the so-called deep learning technology, which is you know, the current state of the art for AI, it's the technology that has allowed computers to beat humans at chess, at Go. I don't think that that flavor of uh, AI, um, that approach to AI, is ever going to get us to safe enough autonomous vehicles. And that's because it works extremely well in fairly well-bounded rules, um, uh, rules-bounded you know, games or, or any scenario um, uh, like that. But can you imagine trying to teach your 16-year-old how to drive by showing them images of every situation that they might encounter, mm -hmm. right? Impossible, mm -hmm. you know, it's an infinite, um, you know, it's not a well-bounded set. And so um, that, and, and that's so difficult because we really haven't 
um, develop the technology to allow um, computers to, to learn to have things like common sense, to infer, you know, well, this happened, so this is likely to happen. Um, so I think we're going to need a, a, a whole new breakthrough in uh, AI mm. um, before we get to um, what is generally considered safe enough vehicles. Interesting. Well then maybe if we kind of apply your kind of previous thought about sort of, you know, robo taxis as maybe being the, the, the segment where yeah. you're going to see the most use of kind of these newer sensor technologies. Near term, yes. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, what about maybe is that s sort of the same rules apply there for maybe the AI providers uh, that they're? That I they're think so, and that's why they're all focused on that. I mean, from Uber um, uh, to um, you know Waymo, mm -hmm. um, they've all made the same calculation, which is if you're running a, a fleet of vehicles, you know, uh, and so for example, in Uber's case, um, the driver takes eighty percent of the fare and 20, only 20% goes back to Uber. But if you can replace the, the driver with a computer, you can keep that vehicle on the road 24 by seven, and you can keep 100% of the revenue. You don't need to pay the computer. Um, so that's the calculus that they're all going through. But I think that there, are, uh, many of them are making a fundamental mistake. Uh. And I predicted recently that I think Uber, my prediction for 2020, is that Uber is going to divest its autonomous vehicle business um, and get back to you know, the business that it should be focused on. Um, Uber generates about $14 billion a year um, in gross revenue. Um, so 20% of that, which is the piece that Uber keeps after you know, the, the drivers take their 80, is what, uh, 2.8 billion. Uber should be able to be an extremely profitable business on, you know, uh, on 2.8 billion of, mm -hmm. of net revenue. Mm -hmm. um, but they're spending a huge chunk of money every year on R&D. Now, I would argue that you know, Hertz and Avis have successful businesses. They're in the service, they're in the transportation business. But they didn't decide that they had to build their own cars in order to be in that business. My view, personal view, is that what Uber should be doing is saying, you know, that's not our business, right? We are the world's best at managing this sort of peer-to-peer, -peer, um, you know, network, uh, crowdsourced transportation, if you will. And when um, some company, some Silicon Valley startup comes up with, you know, safe enough technology, great, we'll use it. Okay. Um, but we don't have to develop that ourselves. Well then maybe just to play devil's advocate here for a second, what about, let's say, robo-taxi type technologies being applied in bounded areas within metropolitan areas where the that's rules where it will start. Could, would, could be more... Uh, uh, I, I think that's where it will start. But you know, I, I think part of the problem is that we have, um, perhaps in part due to uh, all of the media hype around autonomous vehicles, we've been misdirected to thinking about autonomous vehicles as a replacement for the car we drive to work every day. And I think that's the wrong way to think about it. I think that autonomous vehicles are going to show up in the market as um, an extension of public transportation. Interesting, right? okay. You know, I get off the train and there's an autonomous vehicle waiting to take me for you know, the last couple of miles to my office. Um, and, and those last couple of miles, you know, would be sort of a, a, a regulated space where, may well where, the, where the AI is, is can more than capable of functioning. Right. And that, you know, a, a, yes. And so it's better to think about um, autonomous vehicles as not being a revolutionary technology, but much more of an evolutionary technology. And in fact, most of these technologies are showing up in so-called ADAS, technologies, which are uh, designed to make driving your regular car, you know, safer, lane assist, you know, keeping you at safe distance. Maybe just explain that word yeah. ADAS and, and what, that, what that means. So ADAS stands for Automated Driver Assistance Systems. Okay. So, you know, one of the first was uh, cruise control. Sure. Right, everybody's familiar with cruise control. And so to some extent ADAS are just, is just building on cruise control. You know, 
in addition to maintaining a constant speed, you can now stay in the lane. In addition to uh, maintaining a constant speed, it will now automatically slow down if you get too cl close to the car in front. And so you can see ADAS, you know, as you know, collision avoidance, so forth, not full autonomy. So you'll have to have a driver in the driver's seat, but evolving year by year until, you know, one year we wake up and yep, my car will actually drive me all the way from home to work without me intervening. All right. right? So, it's going to so, happen in that way. So incremental improvements. Incremental improvements. To ADAS yeah. as opposed to kind of revolution of autonomy. Sensation. Yeah, uh, right. coming from nowhere. Exactly okay. right. Understood. Yeah. Well, then let, let's pivot from that then. Okay, so let's talk about the automotive industry as a whole and sort yeah. of your thoughts on how this is all going to play out. Yeah. So there's some very interesting dynamics playing out in the uh, automotive industry. Um, firstly, as, as good news, um, you know, as a result of all of this money and innovation in the automotive industry, uh, Detroit's actually coming back. Um, you know, I, I go there once or twice a year and, you know, you can feel the economy coming back in Detroit. But it's not going to come back around, um, you know, uh, bending sheet metal. And, uh, and the, 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 the challenge that the automotive companies have is so much of their infrastructure and expertise has been built on you know, construction, building a car, um, uh, production lines to you know, bend the metal, install the engine, and the internal combustion engine itself. And by complete coincidence, to some extent, we've got this confluence of you know, all of these autonomous technologies and electric vehicles happening at the same time. Electric vehicles are much easier to make than internal combustion engines, far fewer parts, uh, it's one of the reasons that um, you know, uh, China has spun up about 20 different electric vehicle cars, uh, uh, co companies recently. Um, so um, you know, I, I think that long term, my prediction is that the automobile industry will go the same way that the computer, personal computer industry went. When the PC first you know, say was born, um, by IBM or you know, Apple in some sense before that, um, there were dozens of companies producing uh, different PCs. And it was you know, uh, very much, uh, it, they were expensive products um, and um, you know, relatively uh, unusual. Um, as the industry matured, the supply chains matured and it became apparent um, there were really only two companies that were making a lot of money out of the PC industry. Mm -hmm. The companies that developed the software, sure. the operating system, and the companies that developed the processor. Mm. And all of the manufacturing went over to, in the PC's case, in Taiwan, right? And I think that exactly the same thing is going to happen um, with the um, automotive uh, industry. You know, Tesla today still actually makes cars. Um, but I don't see them long-term uh, being in the you know, car business because they're really a technology company. Um, it's the reason I don't think Apple is ever going to get into the car industry. You know, they make fantastic margins selling computer products. I mean, the gross margins selling a car, it's miserable. You know, it can be single digits or mm. teens. That would completely tank Apple's gross, you know, blended gross margin. Understood. So my prediction for the uh, industry is there will be a few small pockets of very profitable businesses, particularly around the operating system, by which I mean the intelligence or the AI intelligence. Um, and then the processor, whether it's a Qualcomm processor or an NVIDIA processor or an Intel processor. And as with the PC industry, they will, most of the profit will go there and most of the manufacturing will end up getting outsourced because that's not the value add, you know, bending metal and, uh, you know, uh, and so forth. Interesting, well, so, so in, the, in the kind of compute market today, right, we have this notion of sort of, you know, cloud native. Yes. Right, okay, and that, and that many of the companies that are developing apps as yep. cloud, relying on cloud native infrastructure have a kind of technology lead that's going to be hard for some of the legacy providers to actually catch up on. Now, other people say yeah. that that's not necessarily the case and et cetera, right? 
can you make the same argument for the for the electric car market that 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 some of the electric natives yes. uh, might have well, a kind of sustainable advantage here? I, I should have added, you know, the today the cloud infrastructure companies, mm. cloud services, SaaS companies mm. uh, in the PC world, um, you know, very profitable, and I can see a similar uh, cloud services model uh, developing for the automotive industry. However, other than Tesla. The interest, the, it's very difficult to change the automotive um, channel to um, support that. I, I give you one example. Everyone that owns a Tesla um, is very used to the idea that sometimes on a daily basis, a, a new bunch of software, operating system software, is downloaded overnight to your vehicle. You wake up in the morning and some new feature is being turned on. Right? Tesla can do that because they bypass the entire um, dealership channel um, that has a complete lock on the rest of the industry. So for example, if GM wants to um, do the same thing as Tesla and, and do sort of what's called over the air OTA updates, mm -hmm. software updates, they can't do that because their contract with the uh, dealership network states that if there is service to be done on the vehicle, the vehicle has to be brought back to the dealership, right? And the dealerships consider updating the software on the vehicle as service. So their contract with the dealers actually prevent them from doing something that basic, right? Um, so there, it's not just a technology issue. The whole um, you know, channel and way vehicles get sold is going to have to change. Interesting. So that's, that, that's, the, that's the advantage of some of the new, the new generation of, of vehicles. I, I would say that, that Tesla has a five-year mm -hmm. lead, technology lead, um, because they, like Apple, are vertically integrated. They're doing everything from you know, user interface, fit and function, all the way down to the semiconductor. You know, they're developing their own semiconductors now. So you know they have become a uh, fearsome competitor in the electronic vehicle space because they've been doing it for longer than um, you know the other major auto companies. They've figured out a lot of the um, you know um, tricks and techniques of, of how to you know extend mileage and, and so forth. And so they have um, you know a substantial lead in the industry at this point, despite the fact that you know over the next. 12, 18 months, every vehicle, com uh, every automotive company is going to be coming out with you know, their own um, flavor of electronic vehicle. So then it's electric more than vehicle. just about having electric uh, uh, drivetrains, et cetera, right? Yes. It's about the whole, the whole suite of capabilities. It's a systems engineering challenge. Interesting, okay. All right, well Rudy, we're going to have to, we're going to, have to leave it there, okay? But I think uh, everything you've told us is, is, it sounds like some good news for some of the uh, tes Tesla stock uh, holders at the moment. I think so. Okay, well we'll, well, we'll, we'll we'll pass on making an opinion about that, but great conversation, thank you for your insights. Okay, this is Donald Klein, uh, host of theCUBE, here with Rudy Berger, uh, managing partner of Woodside, uh, Woodside Capital. Great, thank you, Don.